So welcome to this pre-recording of the second lecture in an in introductory graduate course on supercomputing. So in this lecture, we're going to introduce more terminology. Um, what is a supercomputer? Uh, how can we uh, think about different forms of parallel computing? So we will start with the classification of Flynn and then define the notion of scalability for distributed memory uh, computers. Uh, this is not a course where hardware uh, plays an important role. Um, so in the second part of this lecture, I will try to uh, give an overview of the different uh, network topologies. Uh, so most supercomputers consist of clusters of computers, how they are connected. So the different type of uh, connectivities one can define. So this is as close as to the hardware as we will ever get into this course. Um, and it will be mainly also defined at the highest level, at the graph uh, level. Okay, so where do we start? Uh, so when we do computing, we deal with instructions and data. So we have the classification of Flynn, which is this four-letter classification. And you see in every four letter, there is the I, the instruction, and the D as the data. So that remains fixed. What uh, is permuted, what is combined, is the single and the multiple. So we start with the single instruction, single data stream. Um, that is the sequential computing. We can still achieve parallelism in this way if we compute multiple items. Uh, so we will spend later in this course uh, some time on the pipelining technique, uh, which can achieve a lot of parallelism from a seemingly strictly sequential uh, computation. The second type listed here is the multiple instruction single data stream. Um, that is here for completeness, but uh, there has not been really that many great examples of that type of um, computation. The two remaining uh, types are quite uh, in use. So we have the single instruction multiple data stream, uh, the graphics computing processing units uh, are a very fine example of this. Um, in general, any type of uh, processing on regular data structures, like vectors or, or array processors, they actually fill, fill, fit this category. Uh, the most general type of parallel computing is multiple instruction, a multiple uh, data stream. Um, so this is our general purpose multiprocessor computer. Um, I will say something about the uh, single instruction multiple data stream. Uh, so there is the data parallelism uh, or the class of data parallel algorithms where the same instruction is executed on different uh, data elements. So graphical processing units, they are the category belong to the category of hardware accelerators. Um, they are similar to other types of accelerators. Two of them are listed here. Uh, they are originating from a very specific and more limited type of computation than the central processing unit. Uh, but they have become quite powerful and also quite a very dominant uh, factor in uh, supercomputing. So two alternatives to GPUs are the field programmable gate arrays. So these are circuits uh, that 
are programmable. Uh, field programmable is the terminology. So they can be customized for and assembled to fit a particular type of uh, computing. Uh, in some sense, uh, the uh, GPUs are the high-end graphics cards. Um, so the and some of them are quite quite expensive. These chips, uh, the FGPAs are often seen to be the low-cost alternative. Um, within the um, as the compensation, then is that the uh, assembling and the um, customization is a lot more uh, hardware oriented. Uh, so this is something for the electronical engineers if you are into uh, building your own devices. Then the other uh, direction is the are the tensor processing units that are developed by Google. So a company with very deep uh, pockets. And they are also reaching teraflop uh, performance, just like with the GPUs. Um, and um, I was in the previous lecture, I was mentioning the floating point and the scientific computing uh, community. Uh, there is, of course, also the growth in artificial intelligence that in some sense uh, has benefited from the increasing computing power but also there are specific hardwares that are being designed to accelerate machine learning algorithms. The last, the last reference that is mentioned at the last line of this slide is a paper from the 2020 Science Parallel Processing Conference where the three different uh, technologies that are listed here, GPUs, FGPAs, and TPUs, are applied in financial Monte Carlo simulations. <coughs> so, uh, this is um, an excursion into the hardware, just to indicate that the 1966 classification from Flynn is still very much uh, relevant today. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, <coughs> we have the single instruction, multiple data, uh, but we also have the multiple instruction, multiple data. Now, how do we program this? Well, there is the single program multiple data. Um, so in the true multi-instruction multiple data, then you can have multiple programs operating on multiple data completely independently. But that's typically not, not how it works. We have a single multiple program that contains different functions that are mapped onto different processors. So that's the programming model that we are going to introduce in this course. It also fits the manager worker pr paradigm. So we have one manager, one processor that is going to coordinate uh, the workers. So if you have P processor, then uh, processor zero will be the manager and then the other uh, processors will be identified as workers. So this fits also within this uh, Flint classification, but not now with hardware, but now with the software model. Okay, we distinguish between two types of parallel computers. <coughs> uh, so the the this is still not this is um not taking into account the accelerators which are kind of a third um level that is attached to this 
uh, but uh, keeping things binary, we have uh, shared memory, um, parallel computers, where every processor can access every memory module. In a distributed memory uh, model, then in essence, every process can also request uh, data from another memory module, but it has to pass through another processor. So that is a, a schematic uh, distinction between uh, the two types of uh, parallel computers, the shared memory and the distributed memory parallel computers. Uh, so there is, of course, the hybrid. Uh, so uh, the last line on this um, slide indicates that what actually is happening is that in a node, so the supercomputer consists of several nodes, every node is actually a shared memory parallel computer. And on every node is also attached one or multiple uh, GPUs. So there is the pure binary class classification as here, but in uh, reality everything is typically a blend of the different types. What is now a cluster? Uh, so uh, it's an implementation of the multiple um, of the multiple instruction, multiple um, data um, classification. So we have a connection of independent uh, set of computers that are combined through software. So there is a, the way the protocol on how the computers communicate with each other is defined. And of course, there is also the physical uh, connection. So this goes back to the terminology of Beowulf clusters, uh, which was um, driven by commodity hardware. So there were many different uh, vendors that were producing compatible uh, processors. There was the uh, open source software uh, infrastructure, Linux and MPI. And then there is also then the commodity networking. So there are dedicated, still dedicated companies for supercomputers, but one can also make or assemble your own uh, supercomputer. So this is the uh, commodity cluster or the cluster computer. <coughs> okay, so we will first uh, consider uh, distributed uh, memory parallel computers. And in uh, computing, in programming with uh, distributed memory computers, one has to pass from one memory module to another memory module via the processors. So the processors are actually passing uh, messages through. So there is communication overhead. So if one looks at uh, the total time, then the total time consists of the computation time and the communication time. And one can define the overhead of communication of uh, the communication computation over communication ratio. So and typically what you would like is that the overhead proportionally actually is of a much less lesser order than the computation overhead. And this determines the scalability of a problem. Um, so in the previous lecture, we talked about the uh, sequential time, the fraction of the time that cannot be made to run in parallel. But as you scale up a problem, um, then we, we have seen that the scale speed up actually reasons backwards, but if you, as you scale up a problem, it can no longer be solved by one computer. So you need several computers to collaborate uh, with each other. 
how well can you increase now the problem size um, that you can still achieve a speed up that the order of the overhead still does not dominate your computation so we will investigate when we look at parallel algorithms as the cost of the communication overhead typically if you are doing a, com a computation that is linear in the data size elements then you hope that the cost is the communication cost will be logarithmic which is also quasi constant if you do a quadratic uh, cost then you hope that the communication cost is linear um, there are remedies uh, so you can overlap your communication with the with the computation uh, that's another form of parallelism that will help you with the uh, cost overhead so scalability in general defines uh, the suitability of a problem to run on multiple processors uh, so one needs to have a reasonable size for a problem to be suitable so there is a lower bound but also there is an upper bound if the problem starts to grow then the overhead may dominate and make it may make it no longer suitable for parallel execution okay so then there is the alternative uh, so the main difference between uh, distributed memory and shared memory is that with a distributed memory system one uses the internet one uses the network uh, communication cost with shared memory one does not have this so there are other problems that are associated with this there is the hybrid uh, which is the distributed shared uh, memory uh, computer where uh, so i would see this more as a programmer now from a programming perspective uh, often having to define your messages uh, as a programmer might not be that attractive so you have the send and the receive messages that can lead to deadlock so there are alternative programming models that are uh, building a layer of abstraction onto the message passing um, so it works when it is working so um, one has to be careful enough that the um, expected uh, execution runtime execution uh, is indeed what that is expected and that if one is not very careful in partitioning the data that and mapping the data to the memory locations that this may actually then has has a very negative consequence so this is still a very abstract uh, slide okay so this is the first part um, so again this is budgeted for a 50 minute lecture and in 20 minutes i have gone through the first part so this is very good uh, so let me uh, try to now sketch the different ways in how one can configure a cluster uh, but first some terminology uh, we uh, define the bandwidth and this is typically still uh, addressed in bits so the number of bits that can be transmitted per second um, we have the uh, the different uh, waiting times the latencies you have the time uh, to start up so do you have the zero length message uh, startup time you have the time to of message to commute to transform through the entire network and then you have the time to send one uh, message 
Uh, one can think about the diameter of a network. Um, so in a way, there is a trade-off. Either you connect every node with every other network with with over, with every other node. And that will work if you have a limited number of nodes, but essentially that will be very expensive. Um, um, the other extreme is that you can uh, have uh, only w one link between every other node. So, but then if you cut, but then that will be a very uh, large diameter. Um, so the diameter will then be uh, almost uh, the uh, half of the number of nodes, which might not be uh, that attractive either. Um, and then we have the uh, bisection, which suppose that uh, one of the links is too busy uh, and is, there's kind of a bottleneck, uh, or if it gets disrupted, then uh, that severely impedes the liability of your uh, computations. So there is the bisection width and also the bisection bandwidth. So these are uh, many terminologies, bandwidth, latency, diameter, bisection. Uh, I hope to be able to illustrate this with several examples. Um, so uh, we have several pre-existing topologies. Uh, so there is the array uh, topology. If you, you, this is where you really want to be very frugal in your connections, so where everything is lined up. Some algorithms may actually benefit from such an array topology. So think about pipelining. Um, so you can line up your, professor, uh, your processors in an array. So where uh, the data flows in one direction, and this might be very suitable. So thinking about these network topologies is often also very good when you think about different type of parallel algorithms. So array and ring topologies, uh, they are connected. Uh, very similar, you have a matrix and uh, the donut topology. So this, these are two-dimensional rings, donuts. Arrays are two them are one dimensional matrices. Um, the hypercube network uh, was uh, a very and it still is a very good organizational principle for uh, parallel algorithms. In the previous lecture, I cited the paper by Gustafsson on Gustafsson's law. So this was on a computation with a hypercube uh, network parallel computer. So here you see the topology. It starts out uh, with uh, a square. So actually the, the, the very first one, the trivial one is not, so this, this actually is not uh, um, quite, um, I should probably have uh, redact this slide. So there is the uh, one edge. So for one dimensional, you have just one edge. Uh, the two dimensional has four nodes. And we label the nodes in the binary number system. <clears throat> and that will have, uh, so we have node zero, which is node zero, zero, node one, which is zero, one, node two, which is one, zero, and then the third node is one, one. So two nodes are connected if the number of bits that they share in their identification labor differs in exactly one bit. So you can verify this property uh, in three dimensions. And then one can also draw these four dimensional pictures. I didn't attempt this, uh, but by connecting two um, cubes. So there is this, uh, there are these uh, algorithms that are defined by these topologies. 
Um, so and going from to an adjacent node is just flipping uh, bits. And again, this can happen extremely fast. So um, every you can get to every other node uh, with a two logarithm of the uh, number of processors. So this scales uh, very well. Um, so the number of connections, uh, so it starts with one in the edge, then it uh, is four with uh, dimension two, then it becomes 12. And um, as an exercise, I will ask you to compute uh, the formula for the general number of connections. Um, so if you want, and you can also compare this with the total number of connections. So if all nodes should be connected with each other, uh, then this number would grow uh, a lot faster than the number of total connections in this hypercube network. Okay, so here is an alternative. Um, I was mentioning the manager worker paradigm. Um, so there it may make sense to have the if you are going to work with a manager worker paradigm, uh, it might be sense to view your network uh, as a tree. So, and actually a hypercube network uh, can be, so the tree can be mapped into a hypercube network. So in a way, this is a more frugal model um, where you have the workers that are arranged at the leaves. Um, so, um, and in, in some sense, this is already, uh, also a hybrid, uh, where you can think of networks as static, but, uh, the, uh, nodes here, uh, the interior nodes are not the processors. Perhaps my initial introduction in the slide was misleading. So you could think of you having your processors sitting at the nodes in this tree, but that's actually not true. The processors are at uh, the, the leaves. Here you have switches uh, that are sitting at the intermediate nodes. Um, one can uh, build in some redundancy. So compared to the hypercube network, you will need fewer connections. Um, um, and you may may make some uh, have some more uh, so to make sure that if this link if one link would for example be disconnected uh, so then the bisection with here um, just one link just by cutting one link and you uh, cut your entire network in half uh, perhaps this might not be what you want uh, so the uh, links uh, higher up, uh, you may have some additional spare cables uh, lying around. Okay, so uh, the previous network was already um, introduced with switches. Here is uh, an implementation for a um, matrix. And uh, so uh, you have um, the connections. So you have the memory modules and the processors. We are connecting the memory modules to the processors uh, via switches. Um, so to achieve this full connectivity, you actually do need uh, a number of switches that is uh, quadratic with the number of processors. So that is also why typically still, um, of course, we now have uh, multi-processors with shared memory with, 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 with hundreds of cores uh, but still that is an explanation here while you probably will never have one chip with millions and, and billions of cores uh, because of this interconnectivity with the switches 
Um, uh, so here is some uh, diagrams of the switches. Uh, so switches uh, represented by these pictures here, and they can be in two states. Um, they're binary, either they're in a pass-through mode or in a crossover. So if we now see this from linking four processors, one, two, three, four, uh, all the switches, if they are in a pass-through mode, then uh, this is this ring topology that you have implemented here. Uh, if they are in a cross, some of them are in a crossover mode, then one is now connected directly to four instead of being connected to two, and uh, two is co directly connected with three. So you have some flexibility in how you rearrange. Uh, the connections in your network. So this allows for a more flexible uh, configuration. Switches can be uh, connected in multiple stages. So here we have a multi-stage network. Uh, so this technology goes back to the uh, very early days of uh, telephone operators where uh, in order to phone goes way back to before my time when I was using starting to use phones but you had to dial an operator and that operator will would uh, connect you with, by setting the right switches on a switchboard um, so um, I was telling that story because uh, this technology worked because people were not trying to reach everybody else at the same time. So all, all switches could be, uh, so you could with a relatively amount of uh, switches, you can could achieve connectivity. Um, but while uh, one... Uh, so here the switches are set uh, to open, so there's no commitment. So in theory, all the nodes can connect to all the other nodes. But if the switch is set to cross over, pass through or crossing, then that will prevent uh, other nodes from communicating. Um, so here you see, uh, so the switches are a technology to realize um, connectivities. Um, so the advantage is that uh, the number of switches, if you have a three-stage uh, network, that the number of switches actually grows logarithmically with the number of processors. So you can still achieve full connectivity uh, with... Uh, a number of switches that does not that actually is almost considered as constant so you can connect 1000 processors with 10 uh, switches so this is technology that is uh, scaling um, that scales um, the labeling of the um, switches with uh, the nodes is also uh, given with this binary number system of uh, the labeling. Um, it's more terminology. Uh, so if uh, there's too much communication happening all at once, then uh, some nodes have to wait for others. Um, so to remedy this instead of sending the entire message all at once one will break up a message in small uh, packages and um, one will be uh, and in this way uh, one cannot um, occupy the entire network now it depends also whether there are buffers at uh, the whether the switches have buffers or not. Uh, typically, if they don't, uh, the package will just be forwarded and will be circulating 
the network until they reach their destination. Um, so deadlock may occur and the e-cube routing algorithm um, so you uh, when a package is not at the destination you go to the adjacent um, node to one of the adjacent nodes uh, by flipping bits and you keep on doing that uh, so this avoids deadlock um, so um, it avoids also that uh, some uh, processors are waiting for messages to arrive before they can send and other processors are often waiting for the processors that are waiting. Um, there is also in uh, the other uh, problem is that life lock that a package will not reach its destination and it keeps on circling forever. So terminology, um, and I probably am again moving a little bit too fast here. Um, I mentioned uh, commodity networks, uh, so there is the Ethernet. Uh, so one with a commodity cluster, one can use uh, the Ethernet uh, that is used uh, for communicating uh, any computer on the Internet. One has to make sure that there is a proper authentication me mechanism, a secure uh, messaging system with a secure shell to uh, bypass the passwords. And one can uh, configure a cluster in uh, this way. So here you have the manager node and then the uh, worker nodes or also compute nodes that are connected. Um, we... I'm not a supercomputer, um, I'm not a hardware guy, so I like my computers to arrive uh, completely configured um, and installed, just the turnkey um, supercomputing. So here are two uh, computers that I have been using in my research. Um, so one of them will be available uh, for students enrolled in this course. So that's the first uh, computer. Uh, two to 22 cores uh, processors. Um, there is hyper-threading, so one can um, launch 88 threads. Uh, there is a lot of um, memory available, and uh, there are uh, two teraflops cards connected to this computer. Um, so the later generation um, had somehow a faster processor. I had to save on the memory. Um, my budget was not so high anymore, but the GPU uh, was almost twice uh, as powerful in theory as the Pascal. Uh, so this is the uh, time of personal supercomputer um, so with high-end graphics cards and multi-core uh, processors one can view a supercomputer as uh, several of those uh, high-end workstations connected to each other um, UIC has for now almost a decade a uh, supercomputer um, so if you want to be a research university, you cannot have, uh, you must have a library, you must have a research library. Uh, you also actually must have a, a supercomputer. And at the time, uh, this was about uh, 3000 cores. So one can count here uh, the number of nodes uh, and uh, the total core count. Uh, this added up to about 3400. Uh, course uh, the total amount of storage um, which was expressed in terabytes uh, of random access memory and then also of course the persistent uh, storage expressed in petabytes so we have the core count uh, the memory count uh, the storage count and then also the fast uh, internet uh, communication 
So I left these specifications up uh, for historical perspective and I updated them the last time when I uh, updated, uh, when last time when I taught this course. So now the number of cores had grown, um, so the number of processors had uh, had been extended. And mainly what is important also are the 50 uh, Pascal uh, GPUs that had been added to it. Um, so having 3000 cores was initially good enough for the beginning, but almost all important scientific computations have been accelerated by the hardware by 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 gpus uh, so that's also the message that i want to give there um okay um this is a graduate course so i have to uh, point at the literature so the classification of Sven, uh, of uh, flynn um, is um, classic um, so you can see here uh, this uh, survey paper. So the original classification uh, dates back to 1966, but was still relevant in 1996. Uh, uh, so this is the survey uh, paper in ACM computing surveys. Uh, cluster computing uh, is uh, described in uh, an entire uh, issue of computing and science and engineering. Um, and then there is the last reference, which is the Encyclopedia of Parallel Computing. So I try to introduce a lot of relevant terminology in this lecture. Um, so kind of um, also referring back to the first reference. So the first reference is the textbook of Wilkinson and Allen. Um, it's a good textbook in the sense that it was suitable for undergraduates. I kind of... Um, compensate for that suitability by trying to compress everything what you would in an undergraduate course probably would see in the first two weeks. Um, I've now tried to condense this first chapter almost in two lectures but added a lot more updated stuff to it. Um, so the field of uh, parallel computing is a rapidly evolving field but there is a very solid core knowledge uh, which is uh, suitable to fill an entire encyclopedia, um, which is also available via our UIC library. Okay, some exercises. Um, I hinted already at uh, the number of links in the hypercube uh, topology. So you could think that the number of processors uh, grows exponentially, which is 2 to the power k, but that is the dimension of the cube. Um, so you, can you express uh, the number of links? Uh, so you can think of the number of links in terms of p, but perhaps it might also be more interesting to think about a formula in terms of the dimension, uh, which is here k. Um, so we talked about uh, the different uh, topologies. Uh, so if you think about the torus, can you map this uh, torus so that you can label uh, so that you have a hypercube? Um, and I think you can. So I, the question actually leaves it up. So give an example of a labeling so that you have uh, a hypercube. Um, configuration. Why is that important? Because some of the algorithms that we will see, the synchronization algorithms, rely on this uh, hypercube connectivity. Uh, so then there are the examples of uh, processor. So you have this eight processor network. So is an example, uh, give an example of a blocking one. And I drew one with uh, eight um, networks. Uh, my slides were a little bit too little, but if you take a sheet of paper, you can draw a multi-stage uh, interconnection network for 16 nodes. 
Okay, so thank you for watching this pre-recording. In the next lecture, we will go into high-level uh, parallel computing. So with this lecture, I hoped to introduce some terminology and address some network topologies, which is, for my perspective, as deep as I can go into the hardware. Uh, and it is very important also to later explain uh, several of the algorithms. Uh, so we have algorithms that are actually determined entirely by the network topology.